Hello, screenwriters, and welcome to Writing for Screens. Today's episode, I have thoughts. David Milch, life's work. My name is Glenn Gers, and I am the chief operating, <laughs> chief operating, chief operating everything of Writing for Screens, a YouTube channel that I have tried to use to leave for you all the things that I had to teach myself in my 25-year career writing for TV and movies on my way out of the business, I thought, gee, it took me all this time to figure this stuff out. It seems a waste not to try and share it a bit. So I have... Um, hmm. uh, <laughs> um, so I have put together on my page a whole pile of uh, short videos, each one about... 10 minutes long. Here's a, this is a picture, a capture of my main channel page. Here's a close up of the playlists. These playlists are where I want you to look. Uh, there's the top three are screenwriting essentials, screenwriting tools, skills, and craft, and the process, being a writer. And in each of these playlists, you'll find 10-minute lessons on a specific topic. The topic is the title. It's also the thumbnail so that you can just scan the thumbnails and see in big, bold colors, dialogue, character, flashbacks, whatever it is. I've tried to give you skills and tools and techniques and insights that might be useful or might not. There's no system. There's no order. There's no plan. Just look the way you would in a, in a toolbox see what kind of tools there are, see how they work for you. If they work for you, use them. If they don't, put them aside. There is no right or wrong way to be an artist. It is all about you figuring out for yourself what works for you and what will help you to do the things you want to do. So let's talk today. Um, hello, Nathan. And hello, Sonia. Um, uh, I have changed the uh, the way I present people's comments um, because they were just too hard to read. Um, all right, so today what we are going to talk about is um, a book by David Milch. David Milch was a legendary uh, TV creator, writer, showrunner. Um, he started on Hill Street Blues. The first show he created that I know of was uh, NYPD Blue. He also then created Deadwood and then a bunch of, of flops, which are actually really fascinating, including John from Cincinnati and Luck. Um, he also worked on a bunch of other shows, but really this is all about uh, the, the stuff where he brought his vision. Um, uh, last fall, I read this book, David Milch, Life's Work, a Memoir. Um, it, is, it is a really interesting book, and, and I've I've been deeply inspired by this guy's work and his way of approaching things, his way of talking about it. I wanted to share that with you because I think there, is, uh, there isn't there is enough of this kind of thinking. Um, it's not for everyone. Uh, you don't have to love his work. You don't have to take this advice. It's just some stuff that I think people, uh, especially in the screenwriting teaching business, they tend to get very... Uh, business-oriented, very success-oriented, very formula-oriented. Uh, David Milch does not do that. Um, hello, Larry. Okay, well, I'm glad you're here for the 30 minutes of lurking. I think you'll see some good stuff. Hello, Pelicans. Um, all right, so here's the deal. And Mario Torre, hello, how are you? Um, okay, so let's talk about this guy. Uh, who is he? Um, he worked on all of these shows for for many. He he was a a, a legend of the of the uh, TV industry, um, both for his personality and for his work. Um, he was had a legendary gambling problem, legendary addictions to coke and heroin, um, a lot of erratic behavior, all of which was uh, balanced by an extraordinary talent and a uh, bringing a literary and uh, spiritual and emotional value to TV that just had not been there much before. Um, uh, and uh, he was famously fired from his own show, NYPD Blue, uh, after the seventh season, they had to remove him as showrunner of the show that he had created and run and wrote much of. 
um, because of his erratic behavior, he would he would tend to um, rewrite the script at the last minute, literally sometimes on the set. He would just say, you say this and you say that and you say this. And the actors eventually were like, we can't handle this. We can't do this anymore. Um, Deadwood famously ended uh, abruptly when HBO um, tried to talk to him about changing the plan for the the, the um, last season. Um, they talked about, could we maybe change the number of episodes or stuff? And he said, okay, you don't want to do it? We won't do it. And he <laughs> walked away. And the show never ended until 10 years later, 20 years later, they finally did a movie uh, to try and pick up some of the pieces that had been left behind. Um, there was a New Yorker profile of him back in the Deadwood days, um, which which was famously controversial because he seemed like a nut job um, and also uh, an egotist and, and, uh, and all sorts of corrupt things. He would write by lying on the floor of his office with, um, with assistants um, typing out whatever he said while he looked at the screen. He had back problems, but I'll also talk about what he said about this method of writing. Um, anyway... Um, hold on just a second. Um, I need to, to quickly um, answer answer a family matter. Um, okay. So um, let me just get into to this book. What, what I want to talk about about this book. Oh, let me let me see. Uh, we got some comments here. Um, okay, so uh, uh, Gregory says hello, everybody. David Legar says happy Wednesday. Um, and indeed, uh, <laughs> yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah, it's an interesting thing. Um, the the movie the movie didn't work. Um, it was it was an interesting experiment, but uh, the the Deadwood movie is what we're talking about. Um, it did it, it brought to me it brought an interesting perspective. Um, it wasn't about uh, com, uh, being like the old show. It, the characters had aged, I think, is ten fifteen years. Um, it was it was it was it was an interesting thing for me. Um, so let's talk a little bit about what I got from this book. The Life's, uh, A Life's Work is a memoir written while the writer who um, had this legendary career um, was suffering from Alzheimer's um, and likewise the, the final Deadwood movie. Um, it, it's actually remarkably clear um, and, and thoughtful um, and conscious of the fact that, that his memory is and his, his ability to... to organize his thoughts is falling apart. Um, David Milch's work is not for everyone. It is full of really, really ornate, high-flying language, um, which is also how he talked personally. Um, It can be disorganized and, and, and bizarre for people expecting the usual thing. What I like about it, first of all, what I like about the book is that he does not talk about the mechanics of writing. He does not talk about figuring out how to win or, or, or the management or optimizing of your writing career. He's not talking about a formula. He, he tends to, to really push back against cliches um, and, and cliche judgments of, of writing and of life. Um, he was boundary breaking um, for, for reasons. He wasn't just like, oh, he, he famously um, used a great deal of obscene language in his um, in his work, and um, there was a reason for that. Uh, I'll read you a passage about that. But I also just like how spiritually and 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 poetically he approaches the job of TV, because TV is notoriously not spiritual or poet- poetic. Um, so so let's just get uh, into to some of these ideas. Um, if you've ever watched the show NYPD Blue, the first seven seasons are the ones that that he worked on, um, and and the language is is weird. It's it's almost Shakespearean. Um, it's poetic, and um, uh, what he said about it, I'm I'm just going to read this to you. It's it's too long to put up on the screen. He said. I was interested in accounting for the divergence between what I considered a credible portrayal of the language of these characters and the way they had to talk because of the limitations imposed by network standards and practices. 
It's a show about cops and criminals and grown up and how the networks required us the character how required us to write the characters was not necessarily how they talked. But that can be okay if you figure out another way to honor the truth and vitality of the characters. And so that's what I was trying to do in that speech, to say the turns of language are going to feel different here, and there will be some artifice, and you'll get used to it, you might even come to like it. I wanted to draw attention to the artifice, and in turn, to the energy of the language. You can make it fresh and vital by obscenity, but also by making it a little silly. It's the same thing. To the extent that the thrust of my work has been toward ever more extreme varieties of language in their profanity or intricacy or strangeness, that has been to show, through the form of dialogue, the variety and ultimately the joy of the energy that's given to us all as humans to exchange and bear witness to. Now, even just the, the, the kind of, of talk I just put in there, the things I just read to you, um, to show through the form of dialogue the variety and ultimately the joy of the energy that's given to us all as humans to exchange and bear witness to, that's some high-flying stuff. Um, anyway, um, that's, that's, that's the, uh, the kind of thing. But what he's basically saying there is he was dealing with, uh, he was working with an actual police officer who had become his consultant. They co-produced the show together. And this guy would talk about the realities of being a cop in New York in the 1980s. And um, there was no way to put that on TV. Um, NYPD Blue pushed the boundaries of, of nudity and obscenity um, and and all sorts of other corruption and 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 other qualities. Racism um, is is dealt with in, in a great deal. Um, and what he was trying to do was say, okay, how do I present this in such a way as to heighten the language the way that street language is heightened without being able to do street language? And his his approach to that was to make it very poetic. Everyone talks in this weird, poetic language. The cops, some street junkie who's robbed a car, they all have this weird way of talking, which at first you can either just say, I can't handle this. Or you can say, holy cow, this is, this is getting to something really exciting and unique. Um, okay. Hi, Dimitri and hi, Trent. Um, okay. The English actor who played Jesus Christ 77, uh, also in John Wick. I, I'm not sure what this, are you talking about? Sorry, I don't know what you're talking about, David. <laughs> um, uh, geez, John Wick, um, he was Keanu Reeves? I'm not sure. Um, okay, hello, Blue Evolution Studio and Lois L's Photography. Good to see you. We're talking about David Milch, the creator of NYPD Blue, Deadwood, and some other, other shows. Um, when he was talking about um, uh, the language of Deadwood, which is notoriously obscene, um, he said, the language, it seemed to me, had to serve two functions. The first was to beat down the viewer's pre-existing expectation that any law would be obeyed. Sentences so soaked with obscenity as to bleach out the expectation that civility would be expected to govern in any given. In other words, he was talking about the Old West. He was talking about the West outside of the boundaries of the United States. That's the point about Deadwood. It's lawless. It is literally a, a place with no nation um, governing it, no laws governing it. And he was talking about, um, he wanted the show to be about the struggle to uh, create a community without the uh, pre-existing laws. How would power, how would a community be organized when you have no law? Um, so uh, anyway, oh, uh, <laughs> Ian, Ian McShane, you're talking about, Ian McShane. Um, uh, anyway, um, so, um, Basically, the, my point about this is that the stuff that, that David Milch does, which is weird, is not done for the sake of weirdness. Um, it is done for the sake of trying to reach a, a poetic thing in his own particular way. He was raised and, and schooled in all sorts of bizarre things, including gambling and crime um, and addiction and uh, 
he went to, to Yale and studied poetry. Um, he, he's just a weird, weird combination of things. So um, let me let me give you some some uh, some of his quotes here for you to, to think about. Um, he's talking about what he does when he starts to work. Um, what the quote begins with is he says, every day before I start to write, I pray and ask to be willing, and then I see what happens. Um, he, he talks about the uh, a recovery, the third strep pair, uh, prayer. And then he says, it's my asking to have the perspective of self lifted and to give myself the situation and the characters, give myself to the situation and the characters. I find that I function most effectively when I sort of disembody myself. I lie there in the floor and I talk and the words come up on the screen and then I fix the words, but I never actually lay my hands on anything, a computer or a typewriter, none of that. It was time to listen, to find the characters up and walking and hear who they were and what they had to say. Now, for those of you who know how I advise people to, uh, to, to work, um, I suggest a more organized uh, and, and, and less uh, uh, mystical work process. But it for him, this was how he got to the place where he could imagine these people and their lives. And, and essentially what he's saying is he's, he's um, finding them and speaking as them. Um, is, is that a real thing? I don't know. It was a real thing for him because it worked for him. Um, but the main thing I want to talk about is how he was saying the function there was not to impose, to say, ah, I have to make a plan and and stick it on these straw characters, but to say, let me think about what these characters are like and try to, to connect to my instincts and my feelings about them and see what I think they would say. Um, he also said, we are organs of a larger organism which knows us, although we do not know it. I regard myself as a vessel of whatever that larger organism is, its instrument rather than the source of the scenes. So a lot of what I try to do is get out of the way. Um, I, what I think is important here is to recognize the different ways that people um, people get into stuff, um, that, that, that people find their own way of, of accessing their own talent. And what he's talking about is, is accepting that, looking for that, trying to find your way of getting to your talent and letting it come out. Um, he also said, my prejudice as a writer was always to stick with the quotidian, that means the everyday, the nuts and bolts, the daily stuff of life. It was probably out of fear, out of not trusting deeper emotions. That's kind of a kind of savage way, a primitive way of working. If you stick with the characters and their situations, the natural impulse of those characters' spirits over the course of time is going to lead them into what is other than quotidian, what is not the everyday. In other words, he's saying, if you're gonna show somebody making shoes or being a cop or being a criminal, and you get into the details of their life, um, and, and you focus on them in that moment, in that scene, um, in, in try to understand what they're like in that moment, you will access, you will connect to all sorts of other things because it's all there in people. Um, uh, okay, <laughs> uh, interesting movie. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, Deadwood is my favorite show of all time. The writing is unbelievable. Okay, uh, thank you, Jacob. Well, my point about this would be if you have that, if you feel that, it is um, A, worth watching his other work because it's, it's really interesting often in how it doesn't work as well as Deadwood. Um, I, I find Luck and um, John from Cincinnati absolutely amazing, even though I cannot actually recommend that you watch it in the terms of, uh, it's, they're messes. They're messy, messy disasters for various reasons. But in that, you are seeing more lightning strike than, than you will ordinarily see. It's something else. Um, so let's talk a little bit about that because um, because what uh, John from Cincinnati, um, hello, this is Kitchy. Um, John from Cincinnati um, is about an alien who comes to Earth um, and and um, enters the lives of a group of surfers, a surfing family um, in Southern California. Um, 
it's it's a weird weird concept um um and and the, and the show is it's it's a mess but there there is something to see there and one of the things he said about this mess let me see if i can find it uh all right da, 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 da. All right. Um, he said, John from Cincinnati, um, basically this, this guy who's this alien, he comes in, he, he seems like, it's sort of like Starman or E.T. It's, it's this, this guy who looks human, but he's be, he, he doesn't seem to understand human life. Uh, and um, and he, so Milch said, at first you think he's dependent on these fuck-ups he somehow fell in with, that he doesn't know anything. But through being with him, we begin to identify John as somehow having a superior energy force. Here is a species that, in terms of understanding, seems to be less than us, but that we identify as pos possessing certain other qualities beyond us. And we like that. We identify with that. We feel that in ourselves as the best of us. All of the characters are so fucked up at, through the start of the show that even when they start to become better, when the miracle starts working on them, it's barely perceptible. Um, the argument of John was that the universe somehow cares about the outcome of our species' adventure, that it wants us to live. In a way that, as dogs and cats perhaps we can't understand, the universe cares. We don't know how, we don't know why, it just feels like it cares. That may be our misapprehension, we're dogs and cats. At the level of content, what we were trying to do was have a spirit of the universe, the mysterious John, engage with the culture on its own terms, using its own language, and gradually persuade the culture to uplift its technology so the species goes on. <laughs> this is a show about a guy hanging out with a bunch of really messed up surfers. Um, and what he said then was, I wanted the fundamental challenge of these materials to be the audience thinking, what the fuck is this supposed to be? I wanted the seams themselves to be so radiantly specific that as you're watching them, you're so caught up in the confusion that you don't give a fuck, but afterwards you're saying, this is the last episode that I watch without knowing what the fuck this is supposed to be. I apologize for all the F words. It's I'm trying to do honor to David Milch. Um, so he's saying, you're, you're, this is the last episode that I watch without knowing what the hell this is supposed to be, which is, in fact, the way we live our lives. I've got to figure out what the hell I am doing. Tomorrow is the day, and that's the line in the sand, pal. Once I draw a line in the sand, believe me, tomorrow is the day. And tomorrow goes by, and it's the same thing. By starting each scene seemingly at the wrong time, you're really making a structural case for that approach, which is that life starts where life starts. That I love. That I truly love. Uh, I, 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 I mean, it, it, what he's basically saying there, he made this thing messy because, to, to adequately confront us with the messiness of life. We go in expecting a show that is going to follow the rules of a show. And when it doesn't, what he's hoping is we're going to say, and at least for me, I did. I was like, okay, I don't understand where this is going or what it means, but it's really alive and I care about these people. And and I honestly think it's 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 you know, it's a risky, a risky strategy to say, I'm gonna write something that's confusing so as to make the audience confront their confusion with their own lives. Yeah, that's a risky thing to do. Uh but it's also, I think, kind of brilliant. Um, all right, let me do some quick hellos. Hi, Donna. Hi, Nacho. Um, okay, David, not a trick question, but any great Ukrainian. Um, the, I, I can't talk about that now. I will try and answer that later, but my, my short answer is no. Um, okay, uh, Mark, yeah, yeah, I swear, I swear now and then. Um, it, when when called upon, when called for, um, when trying not to make uh, YouTube make my show canceled, um, is the curiosity and mystery that drives us forward. Yes, exactly right. Um, and I believe that that David Milch, more than any other writer I know, almost um, except for maybe Jim Jarmusch, a couple of others, um, believes in the mysteriousness of art. Um, 
Let me give you a couple more quotes here because they're, they're really something else. Um, okay, so um, let's talk about this. Um, yeah, it's, just, it's, it's much on the same topic. He says, though I'd be grateful to accomplish some overview or summation, I flinch from that presumption. The patterns and urgencies and imperatives will reveal themselves. The very idea of not knowing as an organizing principle is to be accepted with proper humility, that it's a privilege not to know and be given a chance to find out. You're always aware there's an irreducible mystery that at best you're going to approach but never going to capture. And reverence for the mystery is itself the organization of the story. So what I'm getting at here is, is this is a very fine line because you can use this to say, I wanted it to be bad. <laughs> um, and yet, if you look at his work, it is structured. It is organized. There are characters who are trying to accomplish things. They are getting frustrated. They are getting damaged. They are finding moments of transcendence, but those moments of transcendence don't solve everything. And that's his point. It's not that it's just a confusing, gargantuan, uh, disorganized mess. It's that the people are facing the inability to completely organize their lives. And he's showing that in a fairly organized way, um, but never tying up everything so neatly that you forget the mystery. Um, hey, thank you, Megan. That's very kind. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I try and do what I can to keep myself from falling into to creative chaos. Uh, let's talk about another quote here. The enormous opportunity that storytelling offers is the chance to accommodate all of the elements of one's own spirit and bring them into the present, into a moment when they're all alive and interacting with one another, and in being alive and interacting, they become healthier. Um, this is the same sort of thing that I'm talking about when I talk about the idea of, of focusing on the moment, focusing on the characters in the moment. You don't have to solve everything all the time. You have to get into the moment, the, the, to bring things into the present, to make them happen, to make it dramatic in that moment. And when you do that, when you do that sincerely and not mechanically, not saying, ah, this will work because it'll pay off with a, with a really great, great quote that can be on t-shirts, that, that instead, if you talk about the characters and have them be alive in the moment and you connect with their feelings, that connection of your feelings with their feelings is going to bring something really, really unique and artistic and magical. Um, oh, that's the same quote. Uh, the first, my first and primary obligation as an artist was to the reality of the characters and their situation. And if I did nothing else or understood nothing else, as long as I did that right, I was going to do okay. I could trust myself to know how a character would behave in a particular situation to put them where they are. But I didn't know the lived facts of their past experience. I watched their behavior to infer what their past must have been to make them behave in that way they do now, and thus what the possibilities might be going forward. That commitment to knowing them, to getting them right, was love. Uh, I, you're not going to see a lot of how-to screenwriting things that talk like this, um, and, and I just felt like it was valuable to remind you that this is possible, that this is important to consider things... Oh. I seem to have lost my, my cool, good camera. Um, let me see if I can get that fixed. While, while not, I'll just do this a little bit and we'll see what we can do. Um, let's see. Um, so the, the whole point of this is that there is so much. I'm here. Don't panic. <laughs> uh, there is so much in the business, which is business oriented and is uh, formula oriented. Um, and the formula, remember, is always simply what has recently worked. That's the point. So that essentially um, it's, it's the, somebody desperately trying to copy somebody else's success in the hope that by copying it, you'll gain success themselves. Milch's point is you can't do that. You have to find truth. You have to find emotion. You have to find vision. And when you do that, in his case, certainly, it, it connected with people in a unique and powerful way. 
Um, and it's worth paying attention to that. I'm not saying you should write like him. I'm not saying like you should be like him. This man made over $100 million and went bankrupt. <laughs> um, he, you know, this, the, he, had, he had definite problems, and he talks a lot about them in the story, uh, in his memoir. Um, but he also talks about the idea that um, uh, he talks about how he did certain things, especially some episodes of NYPD Blue. He talks about how they, they were cr created and constructed out of a mixture of cop lore that he heard from various cops who were advising him and um, screenwriting craft and then personal connection to the ideas. That's the point. Um, okay. Hi, Karkithian. Um, David, I'm going to, I'm going to get to you when I am done with the topic I'm on. Um, and then I will try and answer those questions. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about Mr. Milch and his, um, his way of approaching art. There cohabit in each of us elements of resiliency and elements of woundedness and imprisonment. What you don't do is try to hide from the complexity of your own feelings. Everyone in that story, he's talking about an episode of, of NYPD Blue, is marked by their own particular experience and their own particular weaknesses. You work with your eyes and you try not to blink. And you listen and you try not to turn away from all the different complexities of feeling. You let yourself feel all of the contradictions, and if you are able to render a world in sufficient complexity, then it all gets told. That's it. I, 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 cannot, I, I cannot express enough how important it is to keep in mind those aspirations while you are learning the mechanics. Of course the mechanics matter. Of course you want to do mechanical uh, professional work. Of course, you want to be able to use your skills and your craft, but without what he's talking about, it's really empty and worthless. And that's the reason I wanted to talk about this guy and his work. Um, uh, when you try and think about things to write, what makes telling stories a useful enterprise requires a passion. It requires, in the nature of your engagement with the materials, a deep and genuine desire to render human experience in an important way. Then you have to stick with it and not back down. Follow it out. I followed it out that time. He's talking about this, these uh, very powerful episodes of NYPD Blue. And in doing that, the meaning of what happened to me changed. He was talking about his own childhood. Storytelling is not therapy, but storytelling can be an instrument of healing in the sense of fulfilling the capacities of our humanity. So uh, that's it. I, I just wanted to spend some time talking about David Milch and this book, because when I read it, um, I, I kept grabbing these quotes and I thought, this, this, is, this is some powerful stuff. And, and the, once again, the main thing I'm talking about is that not that some particular writer's quirks are the answer. That's not the point. The point is, by taking his quirks and by taking the, the, the very... Um, mechanical lessons of other writing teachers and by taking the, the style of other writers and passing them through yourself, you will find your best abilities. The most important thing to do is to be open to how many different approaches there are to art. Hi, Riley Cooper. So glad that you're here live. That's very nice. Um, that's okay. You still got some time. Ask a question if you want. Hi, Doreen. I'm going to briefly uh, now get into some other questions. For instance, um, from David earlier on, um, well, first of all, um, the, the Ukrainian question. I just don't, oh, oh sorry. Um, uh, I don't, I don't honestly, I don't know what a Ukrainian drama movie would be. Um, unless you mean a movie made by people uh, in the Ukraine about Ukrainian life. I don't happen to know any of those. Um, as far as the later question, does music inspire, motivate you in your writings? Yes. Um, I almost always, um, until recently, had music playing when I was writing. However, I will make a big, big point about this. I personally find that it is 
almost impossible for me to write when listening to music I do not know. I can only use music if I already know it, if it's already sorted itself out in my brain and I have maybe a feeling for it from it. Um, it could have a, a certain pace or a certain spirit that I like. But the truth is, I'm only, I, I, it only works if I am, if I am working a, alongside music that I've already pl played and listened to. I can't be like listening to you know, new releases on Spotify because I'll, I'll, be, I'll be focused too much on the, the music. The point about music is, yes, it is a, uh, a way of getting a rhythm. It's a way of getting emotions. Um, it's a way of giving yourself some sense of time because it's really easy to lose your sense of time when you're doing creative work. Um, so anyway, um, the answer is yes, music does matter. I really tried to learn not to put music into my writing because of rights issues, excuse me, and the fact that uh, you just, you just, uh, uh, you're going to make it difficult for your script if uh, you are relying on a piece of music to to carry the day. I know that movies do and shows do it all the time. They add a layer of music. They work with a song. Sometimes you get somebody like like Scorsese or Hal Ashby or the, the movie Baby Driver, in which people are constructing sequences using music. You shouldn't do that. That is for somebody who has the ability to actually access and control the production and release of the movie. Um, the most important thing you should do is try to get the feeling and translate it. Um, if you say like, oh, this music is playing in the scene, what you're really doing is saying, I'm not going to do that work. You're actually sort of cheating, cheating yourself, cheating the reader um, by saying this music will tell you how to feel. That works in a movie because a movie is different from writing. A movie is different from a script. A movie is a whole experience involving uh, performance and production, and uh, that's a separate art form. Writing a script, don't write music into the script. If you like listening to music while you're writing it, that's great. Another tip, though, <laughs> be careful. If you always write a certain scene with certain music, you might actually think the scene works better than it does because you're all hyped up on the song you're listening to. Uh, okay. Thank you, Megan. I, this is a weird one. I don't usually do so much reading out loud, <laughs> and especially reading out loud of such spiritual and abstract stuff. But I, I think now and then it's important to remember that those elements are part of what we do. Um... um Congratulations, uh, as far as you've got in, in, you got to the quarterfiles, but not the semifiles. You know, contests are a weird, weird thing. You don't, contests, uh, sales, business, all of that stuff, anything where you are putting yourself into a contest um, is, is, it's important to recognize it as like, yeah, you're you're dropping a thing into a, a, a stream and maybe it'll float, and maybe it won't. That's not a reflection on the quality of the thing. It's a reflection on the quality of the stream that it's in and the other things around it. Um, you should not um, think that, that your ability to um, win a prize or get a, a movie made is somehow a proof of you being good or bad. That's, that is the wrong way to look at being an artist. That is the way that people in a business look at it. And frankly, it's a bad way to look at the business too, because the things that are chosen are usually chosen for crappy reasons. And as we know, so many of the things that seem to be, that, that are intended to be successful are not. Um, so anyway, um, how would you take the note too gory from a screen consultant? I would say if everyone who reads it says too gory, um, that's something to consider, but only to consider in the fact that if you wanted it to be too gory, if the point of this, if it's supposed to be a really gory movie, then you're looking for an audience that wants that. If people are saying it's too gory, they're clearly not that audience. But as far as a screen consultant, a script consultant, any kind of paid person who's judging, they are giving you an opinion. That is one person's opinion. There is, no, I, I guarantee you, we have, anybody who's worked as a professional has encountered some legendary other artist, some, some director or actor or other writer, and heard them say stuff that you're just like, I, 
don't think that's true. <laughs> it's a, they're not God. They're not. They don't have secret answers. They are just slightly more skilled. They may have experiences. They may have some insight into the business. But but to say, you know, um, oh, what was it? I was reading recently about somebody. Um, and, and they they wrote their their best work and they showed it. It was like groundbreaking new work and they showed it to their mentors and their mentors said like, no, this is trash. Their mentors were wrong. The work was great. It was just not what the mentors were used to. Um, once again, the, the, the point about feedback is um, if it's not helping you to, to find ways to, to, to write the way you are trying to write, it's not helping you. Um, if you are trying to get business advice, um, then too gory might be good business advice in the sense that if you're not doing a horror movie, if you're doing a if you're doing a romantic comedy and somebody says too gory, it's something to think about. <laughs> um, uh, thank you. I assume that's about the music note. Do you critique people's scripts? No, not anymore. I, I did that for a couple of years. I am now working on a novel and I do not have time to do one-on-one -on -one, uh, script reading. I apologize, but there it is. Recently, Najo says, my written work has been compared to that of V.C. Andrews. Call, call me there, V.C. Have you heard of her? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. She was back in the 70s. Um, um, yeah, look her up. Um, she wrote some, some best-selling um, novels, uh, horror novels back in the 70s, very, very popular. Um, I've never read them. I don't know if they're any good. Um, it is amazing how we could use mystery and curiosity to make our story more engaging and interesting. Can you tell us some important points from him we could use when writing? Uh, by the way, him him being Milch, uh, the important points would be watch the shows. <laughs> um, watch the first seven seasons of NYPD Blue. Watch Deadwood. Um, if you're feeling adventurous, John from Cincinnati or Luck. Um, uh, my point would be study the work of this man. And if you want to know more, read this book. Um, there you go. Um, you have to find your own way. There are not things, there are things you could borrow. You can borrow a lot of tricks from watching somebody's art, but you can't do that. Um, you know, there's no, uh, whatchamacallit, there's, there's no like, ah, you know, use a flashback here. That won't, that won't do it. Um, there's a video I did called Take Art Apart. I will put a link to it in the description uh, about 10 minutes after this video is done. Um, I would suggest watching that because my point about it is you need to figure out what what connects to you in this work. Some people might say, ah, I see how he did this structurally. Some people might just say, oh, I like the, the, the way he doesn't explain a character. It's going to be personal to you. Um, and the way to do it is watch the work. Watch the work. Hi, Ricky. I think it's hyper intelligent alien. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, yep, yep, yep. I would completely agree with that. Uh, all right. Hello, Lake Filter. Good to see you. Um, if I wanted to write a show, would you format it like a wrong? Um, I'm not sure that they're that different. Um, but I would, if you want to write a show, write a show, format it like a show script. Like if you can, if you have samples of scripts from Abbott Elementary or The Office, borrow their format. Absolutely. Um, uh, there isn't, uh, to me, there isn't that much of a difference. And yes, there's act breaks and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, if you are working in a certain form, if you're working in a feature, if you're working in an hour long drama, if you're working in a sitcom, Study some scripts in that form and borrow, you know, take the form. Don't borrow the, the words, borrow the form. Um, all right. Um, okay. Uh, there is no Patreon. I haven't, I haven't gotten around to that. Um, at the moment, I'm just trying to um, give. I'm just putting this stuff out there um, to the extent that I can. Um, down the line, if I find I, I need some money, um, I will ask for, uh, I will set up a Patreon. But thank you very much. That's very kind. Um, Najo says, I have had one script reader say my script was the best of the year. Another reader said of the same script, I should take screenwriting classes. Go figure. That is right. Uh, very important when you are dealing with um, any form of criticism to think, A, 
what is it that the person who's criticizing me thinks this should be? Because very often they want it to be something different than what you're trying to make it. And therefore their frustration is because you're trying to do a different thing than they want. Um, the other thing to remember is you all know, you'll feel when you hear a criticism, you know, I was a little worried about that and apparently it was a legitimate worry. Or you'll say, oh yeah, I thought it would play like this, but it's not. You'll feel a certain amount, if you allow yourself to be open, a certain amount of like, oh yeah, you know, it is too gory. I was kind of trying to push the gore, but but maybe I'm just, I'm too gore happy. Um, the thing that you need to do is think about um, to the extent that you what you are trying to accomplish and how much what they're saying has to do with what you want to accomplish. When it is, you'll tend to notice it. You'll tend to say, oh yeah, that helps me do what I was trying to do. If you are looking for someone to tell you this is going to work and this isn't going to work, this is going to sell and this isn't going to sell, no one can tell you that. Everyone in the business, there's now a whole business of telling you what can and can't sell. They don't know. If they knew, they would do it. And if they did it, they wouldn't be telling you that because they'd be too busy selling their own scripts. I guarantee you, every producer and agent and representative and, and everybody, they are trying to figure out what will sell and they come up with theories. But if they were right, they would have a 100% track record. They're not. They're just guessing. Okay. Um, all right. Eric Hai says, on writing by Stephen King, he says he avoids outlining because if you know what's going to happen, it won't be a surprise. When you write it, it won't be a surprise. Um, do you happen to have any thoughts on that? I do. Um, and I will tell you once again, there's um, uh, two of my videos on this exact topic. Uh, why outline and how to outline. I will again put the um, links to those two in the description underneath this video on the YouTube page about 10 minutes after I finish talking. Um, uh, anyway, I get into great detail about why I do not believe that, um, that you uh, take away your surprise. You simply put the surprise into the outline. It, it still happens and there's still more surprises to come. We are, we are all constantly surprised as we write. Um, however, the thing I will say is there are many successful writers who don't outline. Um, that's fine. Some of them don't need to. They simply can keep it in their head. Some of them, for whatever personal reason, they feel like they, they can't do it. It ruins the process for them. If that is true for you, just be prepared to essentially outline after you write. In other words, to have to do rewrites. I've told this before, but famously, Neil Simon, a uh, great playwright of the 20th century, uh, did a lot of comedies. He famously did not outline. He also famously had to rewrite the third acts of his plays multiple times, sometimes in a panic, on the road before opening on Broadway. Um, there's a connection there. There's a reason that things are not making sense at the end because he didn't outline. If that's the process that works for Neil Simon, I'm not going to say he shouldn't have done it. I'm just saying you have to recognize that. Likewise, Stephen King, while truly a terrific, wonderful, great writer who I love to read and admire a great deal, structure is not his strong point. <laughs> um, he's not great at, at um, planting leads and, and having them come up later. He's not great at, at having stories make sort of make sense at the end. Um, it doesn't really matter. He mostly writes novels, and those novels, novels don't need that same, necessarily, that same sense of cohesion that a commercial movie does. A good art film doesn't need it either. Anyway, my point is, um, I believe that Stephen King is right. Um, Stephen King also says he roughly outlines. Um, then you get someone like John Irving. John Irving famously said he needs to know what every moment of the story is exactly written down so that when he writes, he can just focus on the writing. Neither one is right. No, there is no right way. But it is worth checking out these videos, why outline and how to outline. So at least you'll get my arguments on how it can work for you. All right. Um, 
yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, how did I like or dislike the Dexter series? Um, I, I felt like it, um, well, first of all, they changed uh, showrunners as they went along, and that tended to sort of take it off its track. I thought that it was the swell in the first season or two. Um, I enjoyed it all the way through the end. I even liked the the, the little extra season they did with uh, the with Dexter's um, kid. Um, that that's not a spoiler. <laughs> um, anyway, the, the answer is I think there's a lot of good stuff in Dexter. I think it got stuck trying to prolong itself further than it really could, and it lost some of its um, focus and just became a thing that was a fun thing to do. There was some good stuff in the last couple seasons, but uh, it it to me it kind of lost its way. However, good show. I would recommend it. Um, what is your favorite book currently? Um, really hard to say any kind of favorites. Um, I am reading, um, Elena Ferrante's, um, uh, My Brilliant Friend, which is phenomenal. Um, and the HBO series based on it is extraordinarily good. All right. Um, so we're wrapping it up. Uh, I'm going to be saying goodbye a little early, um, because I got stuff to do. Um, this has been fabulous. Thank you for these wonderful questions. Um, I will um, put those links in uh, the description when I get done. I hope that you all have a great week, and I hope that you go write something.